Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Snowbridge webinar episode. In this week's episode, Modo 901 exciting new features. John Bucaresco will be highlighting some of Modo's new and enhanced modeling tools as well as improved sculpting features. He will also give a demonstration of Modo's phenomenal retopology tools and Mesh Fusion, an incredible live Boolean tool, once a plugin and now a fully integrated part of Modo. He will also be showing Modo's new physically based materials and non biased rendering features. John Bucaresco is a Modo creative specialist. With the, fun, with the Foundry, here he is, a London-based software developer specializing in software tools for both the visual effects and the industrial design industries. Before coming to work with the Foundry, John spent nearly 20 years as a visual effects artist, working on and supervising many television and motion picture productions. Also trained as an industrial designer, John has accepted the role of helping many design firms integrate Modo into their creative process. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novetch. Novetch is one of the largest online stores for design software, and we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our webpage at novetch.com. And for more daily software news and limited time promotion, Pay visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. On our next Novage webinar, Essential Maxwell Render Tips and the new version 3.2. Last but not least, our webinar today is being recorded live and it's free. So if you want to watch this or any webinar episode, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vima channels. And now, without further ado, I'm going to pass screen and uh, Mike to um, John, and uh, he can get started with this incredible presentation. You go, John. Okay. You're the best. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, thank you, Barbara, for that introduction. Most gracious of you. And uh, as Barbara mentioned, my name is John Bevaresto. And uh, as you may have already guessed, uh, Modo uh, is a fully featured 3D subdivision model surface, um, subdivision surface modeling program, animation, visual effects, and rendering program. Uh, it was designed from the ground up to be a visual effects content creation tool, uh, but now in its 10th year of development, uh, version 901 rapidly, readily, excuse me, <laughs> addresses uh, all the needs of the visual effects studio. And what you are looking at now is a small sampling of some of the best moto artists and uh, arguably some of the best CG artists in the world. Uh, as you can see, we have an outstanding community of very talented 3D artists who love what they do and really love the tools that they use, namely moto. Uh, not only are our uh, users quite prolific and creative, but they're also quite demanding. And we've strived over the years to uh, listen to our users' input, uh, but not just meet the needs uh, uh, and the challenges that they present, but also go beyond with a cutting edge technology that we develop ourselves to help satisfy their current needs as well as their future needs. Uh, besides the visual effects community, uh, we've watched other industries embrace Moto as well uh, for both ideation and as a commercial rendering tool. One of those industries is that of industrial design and uh, more recently that has been the focus of my work. Uh, so what I'd like to do for our little demonstration today is give you a somewhat broad overview of a few of the new Moto features, uh, new to 901. Uh, features that help make it a great content creation tool. Uh, this is by no means a complete look at Moto uh, and all the things that Moto can do, but I think it will give you a good idea of the depth and quality of the tools that are integrated into Moto, uh, the kind of tools that, like I said, make it a great content creation application. Uh, however, for the sake of those who are kind of new to Moto, uh, I'd like to take a moment and give a quick tour of Moto's interface. 
So without further ado, I'm just going to switch screens here. And uh, I'm going to uh, jump over to this scene real quick. And, and you can see that uh, Moto was designed from the ground up, like I said, as a visual effects tool. But uh, Moto's interface was designed with a task or workflow at its core. And it's essentially a collection of different viewports and tool panels all bundled together. So, uh, but they're organized in a way that allows the user to um, uh, develop or, or, or to execute tasks that are, that are um, common to, to what they do in the industry. For example, uh, if I'm in the modeling work tab here at the top, all the tools that I need to create a model are on the left-hand side, and all the information is on the right. And this is consistent throughout all the different uh, interfaces. Uh, topology, same thing. Topology tools are on the left. My viewport is in the center, and then on the right-hand side, I have all the information. UV, if I want to edit my UV tools, I can uh, easily uh, work in this viewport, and you can see all the tools needed to work with uh, topology uh, are, are on my left-hand side. Now, that doesn't preclude me from actually doing modeling work within this UV edit layout. I can actually call up a modeling uh, panel as a floating panel and actually continue to work on my model within this viewport. So I can uh, go over to the paint area here for sculpting and painting tools, which I'll demonstrate later. Uh, we could go to layout, which I use quite a bit, uh, which allows me to actually uh, apply textures and see, see my rendering in real time here with our, with our preview viewport. Uh, we can do setups if we're doing character rigs, for example, uh, and I'll use this to, to demonstrate uh, some other uh, tools. Uh, we can set up characters. We can do uh, particles, uh, dynamics, and, and notice I'm clicking here on this, on this, what we call our edge tabs, and this is a way of storing different panels that uh, don't take up a, a whole lot of space. So it's a very clever way of, of creating uh, an interface. Um, we also have the animate tool. Listening to people who do animation, who are animators, they wanted as much space as possible to do animation with. And uh, so if you have a if you have a character that is rigged, um, you can. You, you can work in this view with, uh, unobstructed by a lot of tools and panels. But you have uh, icons over here that allow you to pull them up and work with them and hide them again. Uh, Moto's interface, as you can see, is very flexible, very malleable. Uh, for example, if I wanted to uh, split this window into two, I can simply grab this drag it over, and I've split my window into two. I can split it uh, vertically as well by gesturing downwards, uh, and uh, I can change each one of these viewports to be what I want it to be. Uh, I also, I can also uh, click the key combination and remove windows, uh, remove, restore. I can split horizontally. And uh, so as you can see, you can pretty much make the interface anything you want it to be. Uh, if I wanted to uh, call up uh, a floating window, I can uh, call up, say, for example, this, uh, we'll just do an empty window here. You'll notice a little arrow on the right-hand side. Basically, uh, this viewport, this window can be anything you want it to be, and any one of these windows can change to anything you want it to be. So if I wanted this to be a preview window, I can just select that. If I wanted this to be uh, another 3D view, I can make that another 3D view. So um, 
like I said, Moto is very, very flexible in this regard. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people gravitate to with regards to Moto because they can easily configure it to be what they want it to be for the type of workflow that they need. So uh, let's see if there's anything else I miss here real quick. Uh, and yeah, one more thing is that you'll find that most of the tools uh, in Moto are very surface level. And uh, if I wanted to, however, go beyond that, I can dig down into individual channels and make modifications and changes there. Uh, I'm going into my setup mode here. I can uh, say, let's just go ahead and grab my seahorse and drop it in there. If you're accustomed to working in a schematic viewport, there's we have a great <laughs> schematic uh, view here. Let you do uh, wire anything to anything, basically. Moto is that extensible. So um, I don't spend a lot of time in the schematic view myself. I'm more of a an old school uh, artist and somebody who, who prefers to work uh, work uh, kind of in an old old method, uh, but but it's there for you. All this all the tools are there. Um, yeah. So uh, of course you can uh, you can jump around if you want um, and work in any way you want. Okay. So. Uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, show you today is, uh, well, some of, the, some of the tools I wanted to show you, one of which is called the uh, Curve Constraint Tool. Uh, it's really uh, uh, what I consider to be one of the uh, cooler features of the new 901. So uh, I'm going to jump over to this scene. You'll notice that in Moto you can have multiple scenes open at one time, and you can literally drag and drop items between different scenes. So I'm going to take this... Uh, this scene here. Uh, it's just a simple plane that's subdivided a bit and use a curve constraint tool to recontour the surface of this and one of the things this allows me to do is create sort of a, something like a desert scape or desert dunes in just a matter of a couple of minutes. So I'm going to go over to here. I'll go ahead and grab a, a curve tool and I'm just going to let me just open this up real quick. I'm um, going to add a new layer here, and I'm going to just quickly click in this viewport. Notice how my curves stay horizontal. Even though I'm working in perspective view here, the curve stays horizontal. That's because of something called a live work plane. If you'll notice real quick that uh, Moto has this work plane that jumps around as you rotate. Notice the work plane now is on the Z, Y axis and now it's on the Y X axis. If I'm looking downward, it is on the Z X axis. And what this does is allows you to work in perspective mode quite intuitively. It allows you to know how your uh, vertices and how your translations are going to move uh, with re respect to your angle of view. And uh, so that, that, that one feature alone took me out of having to work uh, in this in, in a quad space in a quad environment. So anyway, um, back to my demonstration here. Um, so I added a, a single spline curve here, and I'm going to add another one real quickly. Just add another uh, layer there, and just drag out. It's just that simple. Um, do one more. And, and I'll just cross these splines over a little bit. There. And, and I like to try to stay organized as much as possible. So I'm going to select all three of those and just call those curve. Rename those. Okay. So now I have three curves. And I'm just going to oops, I'm going to select all three of those. And I'm going to move them up a little bit so that they're not actually on top of this surface. So about a meter or so away. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my ground plane here. 
and I can also select it just by clicking in the viewport. And I'm going to jump over to my setup area here, setup tab. I'm going to drag that down because I don't need that. And seeing this in wireframe might be a little easier first. I'm going to uh, show this in wireframe so you can see what I'm selecting. I'll select that curve and I'll go all the way down here to the deformation edge tab and I'm going to select curve constraint. And I get a request here that asks me uh, which curve I want to use. And in this case, I'm going to start with the first one here. All right. And now what you'll notice right off the bat is that there are these little rings attached perpendicular along the length of this curve. And what that is, is that's the force of influence that that curve is going to have on the mesh below it. Okay. And I will go ahead and do the same thing to the curves, curve constraints. I'll do this number two, and I'll do one more. And so we have all three. As you can see, it added a curve constraint effector to that ground plane, three of them. So I can select these. And we can actually see the effectors on there. Now what I'm going to do real quickly, I'll switch back to my uh, default view. And I'm going to increase the threshold of the influence in these curves. And as I do that, you can see that these curves are pulling on the surface of the, of the ground plane. And since they were raised above it, they are pulling it up to the curve. So I can just select these curves. I can move them up a little bit, get a little more height out of it, and go back to my curve constraint effectors and just increase that even more. And before you know it, you have a bunch of, you have a uh, landscape of desert dunes. And what's really cool about this is since this is kind of parametric, we can actually go ahead and animate these curves. Since I have an animation uh, timeline below this, I can easily, let's see, move this over here. And I'm just going to click here to add a keyframe. Move down my timeline, let's say frame 60. Let's move this over here and it automatically created a keyframe for me. So as you can see, if I play this, it will move that curve. Oops, computer's a little jumpy here because it's on, it's probably networking here. There. You can see it's a very, I think it's a very, very useful feature. If you wanted to do uh, waves cresting or whatever uh, on a surface, something that uh, can be easily done. Uh, let's see, and if I wanted to also, I could constrain these curves to a spline so that the I can actually wiggle the shape of that curve over time if I wanted to do that. So um, with that, I can uh, just add a few uh, textures to it, and before you know it, I can have a, a desert scape. Uh, by adding a few textures and in just a few short minutes you can have a lovely set of dunes. I'll let that resolve. What you're looking at right now too is our, uh, this is our preview window and it ad actually will address everything that final render will, will render. You can uh, actually use the preview window to uh, generate animations or, or final renders, and a lot of people do that. It's, it's, it's called progressive rendering, and the longer you let it set, the, uh, the more it resolves. Uh, it might be a little hard to see at the bottom here, but you can see a, a, a percentage window that, that determines the amount of convergence, or what we call finish, 
on, on a scene or uh, an image. So if I let this sit for a while, it's going to resolve this to a very high level of, of refinement and allow you to uh, actually save this out to, uh, uh, as a final render. So uh, as, a, as opposed to our bucket render. So it's a very good way of working. Um, one more thing with regards to these uh, curve constraints, um, we can also use them uh, to work on, uh, in the automotive industry, uh, these contour lines or character lines uh, are king, are master. And using this technique, you don't have to really follow tours of the geometry of your object as you normally would if you were going to do something like, like an edge weight. Uh, and if I turn these off, you can, you can kind of see how it, uh, how the influence here. Let's see, I think, uh, there we go. So I can, I can select these speed forms. And oops, I'm turning off the wrong thing here, sorry about that. Can see how this works. Turning them off, you can see what the speed form looks like without the curve constraints. And as I turn each one on, you can see how I've, I've added these uh, character lines just using this curve, curve constraint tool. And it's a very, it's a, I think it's a great way of, of working and sculpting your, your model. Okay. All right, well, let's see, moving on. Um, let's see. We have another uh, cool tool in Moto uh, called the Background to Multi Mesh. Um, this is what I consider to be a sculptural tool. And a lot of times people get these scans and uh, really high resolution objects that are just impossible to work with. And they need a way of kind of de-resing it as, as it were. Well, and, uh, and yet still retain a lot of the detail in the original mesh. So uh, what we have is uh, something called uh, background to multi mesh, and what that allows us to do is actually take the detail uh, of the background item and apply it to the foreground item. And I'm just going to use a simple plane to demonstrate this. And it doesn't have to be a flat plane; it can be a contour, it could be it could be a hand, it could be uh, any any high resolution object that you can apply to another. Uh, low resolution object that's uh, similar in shape. So if I go to my uh, sculpt tools here, let's see. I'll go to my utilities. Let's do make sure I'm on mesh. Background to multi mesh. And we're going to set this at a level of three. And it will take a moment here. Now what it's actually doing is it's actually firing rays from the item, uh, the high resolution item, and applying those coordinates to the low resolution item on top of it. So we'll see the result of that in just a moment. And the, the amount of detail will depend upon how much subdivision you give your, your foreground object. Um, I can actually uh, make it a much higher resolution object and get that detail. So yeah, it's taking up a few minutes on my little MacBook here. And the, the, uh, uh, the amount of time that it takes uh, to do this is contingent on the level of the detail 
on the foreground object as well as the background. So as you can see, there's a lot of detail in that uh, background carving, yeah, that architectural piece. And there we have it. We have now the foreground object now has the details of that background object. Now, of course, it's not super clean because the, uh, uh, the foreground object uh, could actually be subdivided a little more if I wanted to. Um, subdivide this uh, floor, and that softens it up, that cleans it up a little bit. Uh, but if I wanted to actually subdivide this geometry and have another go at it, it would, uh, it would give me even more detail. So that's one method that we have of actually getting uh, some sculptural detail into high-res sculptural detail from, say, like uh, an application like ZBrush uh, into, into a, uh, a form, uh, kind of a quad mesh, something that's easier to work with. So, all right, so that is background to multi-mesh, and that is uh, new to uh, 901. And let's see what else we have here. Some very cool scenes. Um, I'm going to show you our new uh, improved slice tool. Um, and what our slice tool can do now, a slice tool has always been in Moto. Um, go here. But um, it now has been improved. And if I go to slice here. I can. Oops. Let's do this. Make sure I have that selected. Slice. I'll cut polygons. You can see now it is actually capping the slice. And of course, it's a it's a real time tool. I can move it around, and it will it will actively cap this object. Now, this object has some thickness to it, so it's capping. It's leaving the interior hollow there, but capping this edge here. And I can also that's a that's a new feature, but I can also um, control the gap of this cap. So this is very useful in uh, Making cut lines and and, and uh, part lines in, in an object. So, and that's a quick, very quick little demonstration of a very cool feature. All right, that's that. Now let me see one more thing here. Uh, let me go into this other uh, utility we have, a normal baking utility. And what this allows us to do is actually bake the detail of this out so that you can apply this to another object, another, another plane or something along those lines. Um, let's close some of these down. So that So if I wanted to, for example, I can uh, position my camera, and I'll go to my layout view here. Yeah, let's give this a second to resolve. There we go. Uh, we can see this is a standard sort of lighting. This is just our regular output shader. But if you'll notice in the shader tree, I've got different outputs here now besides just my final color output. And I position my camera directly over the top of this so you can see. Um, I, so with the um, with our uh, preview render, you can actually view the different types of outputs that you're going to output, uh, you're going to render out. So this is a uh, this is a depth pass. If I want, I can output this pass and apply this to uh, some geometry as a deformation map. Um, I can also do that with the ambient occlusion. 
So you can view all the different outputs here that uh, that you can use. Um, and let's see. Uh, the other thing we can do is a geometric normal. If you're familiar with normal mapping, you could use this to uh, get a, an impression of the detail of the bumps on top of on top of your object there. So I'll show you real quickly. Uh, let's see if this will work. I haven't tried this, but uh, um, I'm going to just go to my ambient occlusion. I'll let that resolve for a second here. One other thing I should mention about our preview render, if you move the mouse over the top of it and just wiggle it around a little bit, all the processors will uh, cores in your processor will focus on that area to resolve uh, the detail of the render in that area first. And this is a great way of being able to uh, check out a part of the uh, image that you're working on uh, to see if it's see if it's uh, looking the way you want it to look. So uh, that's a really kind of cool feature to have. Um, so if I want to, I can uh, just save this image. I'm going to save this image to my desktop. We'll just call it, uh, well, I'll call it preview. What the heck. And I'll just save this as a JPEG. Nothing too fancy here. And then I'll go ahead and load this. Um, go to my clips. I'll load that image. And I'm going to click my desktop. And let's see. I think this is, that wasn't it. <laughs> Sorry. There it is. Put that in there. I'll go to my. Turn that off. Turn that on. Oops. I'm just going to drag this off to here. Actually, it's easier if I do this. Uh, let's go to my item, that's why. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and add an image map from my, uh, my clip browser. So, and you can see that image map now is applied to that plane. And I'm just going to do this as a displacement. Now it's not as clean as I want it to be, but uh, you can see that it is as actually starting to displace that. Now if I were to clean this image up, uh, I would have a much better quality displacement on that. I'm going to convert that. There we can see it. I can also probably have this as a bump as well. So you can see that you can transfer all kinds of detail from from a scan or, or a, uh, a high resolution image onto a low resolution object with uh, fairly easily actually. So okay, moving on. All right, let's see. Um, Let's see, the next thing I'd like to show you is the symmetry tool. I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here. Um, something new in Moto is our, uh, an improvement, actually, of our symmetry tool. We've always had symmetry in Moto, and um, I'm going to turn off topology. We have something new called a topological symmetry, or as I like to call it, relative symmetry. And um, if I am, uh, let's see, if I'm selecting this object, you can see that um, everything stays pretty much symmetrical. But if I get off symmetry here, if I turn off and turn off symmetry here. Uh, 
Let me simply go in there. Oh, that's fine. It's hidden there. And I turn off symmetry. There we go. I think it's off. Um, move this around like that. Now turn asymmetry back on again. You can see that the area that I moved is no longer tied to the other other side. They lo it lost symmetry. So I'm going to just revert back here to the original. And I'm going to make sure symmetry is on. It's a logical symmetry. Okay. And if I uh, select my polygons here, that stays symmetrical. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to turn off symmetry here. And I'm going to change it. I don't want to go crazy with it, but you can actually move stuff around. And back to my symmetry mode there. And select my polygons. Oops. And they still, now they still remain in symmetry. At least, at least you can select and move around objects that are not in perfect symmetry. So if I wanted to move this step around, you'll notice that the other side is moving as well. And that's our topological symmetry. And it, and it stays it stays such as well. So um, if you went crazy with it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to find uh, uh, the symmetry mode again. But you can actually uh, go and, and get the center line off axis as well, and it will it will maintain symmetry. Uh, I'll turn this off real quick, and I'll just move this around. That right now. Turn symmetry back on, and you can see it still remains symmetrical. So that's a cool new feature. It's very useful in, in especially doing uh, characters and that sort of thing when you when you actually don't want them to be uh, symmetrical, but you need to work on both left and right sides uh, simultaneously. So um, since I have this guy open, I'm going to um, I'm going to turn off symmetry here and go over to our Sculpt and Painting tab here. Um, something that's new to Moto is uh, multi-resolution sculpting. Well, we've had multi-resolution sculpting uh, before in the past, but it's but it's I think it's vastly improved. Um, and this is this is not a multi-resolution object, but I can sculpt on it nevertheless. Um, but if I add uh, multi-resolution to it, now I have a greater degree of resolution to my skull. You can see that it, it has more detail to it. If I uh, step up a couple of steps in the multi-resolution, it has even more detail. But that detail doesn't really get in your way as, uh, as uh, polygons uh, you know, on the screen. So I'm just going to... And see how I can paint much more uh, detailed sort of sort of uh, areas here, um, and then you can step you can step up and down in the multi-resolution chain. Uh, move it up for more detail. That sort of thing. I'm, I'm just using my mouse to sculpt it, so you have to forgive me for my clumsiness here. The other thing we have now is sculpting layers. Um, we can actually add layers now to our sculpt so that uh, uh, you can kind of non-destructively uh, add layers and sculpt on them, turn them on and off, off at will. 
and I'll turn that off and uh, just sculpt on this layer. Maybe I'll use a clay tool instead here to add more, a little more, more detail to it. I can control my brush density and size and I edge my brush. I hope, I hope this is coming across okay, but you can see that. And if I go to my layers, I can turn this off. Actually, um, or maybe I was sculpting on there. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it uh, popped in and off. It's just taking a minute or so. Um, but uh, but yeah. So so layers are now a part of sculpting in Moto. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go to. Uh, okay, I'm going to close some of these scenes because I don't want to. I'm starting to stack up a lot of scenes here and take up some memory, so I'm just going to close some of these. If you'll bear with me for just a moment. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm just going to go ahead and close all. How about that? There we go. I'm just going to open, let's do this hood ornament. Moto has really vastly improved its daylight shader, actually. Um, it's always had daylight shading, but with the more recent improvements in Moto, it allows you to actually see uh, a more accurate representation of true sunlight and true daylight. Um, what I have here is a, a little hood ornament. Uh, I'm going to hide some of the uh, texture locators so I don't get in my way here. There we go. All right. Now notice I have a normal map on on the, the hood of the car here, which is a kind of a corroded old uh, automobile hood. Um, and this is kind of the nature of how some of the uh, textures are applied and, and that sort of thing, viewing it in, in this sort of mode. Um, if I go to texture mode, um, I can see the hood a little bit better, but it really doesn't give me a good accurate representation of lighting. We have something new called an advanced mode. And um, as I click on that, it takes a second. But what it's doing is it's buffering that image now or your whole scene to my to your graphics card, and uh, I have an NVIDIA uh, graphics card in my machine here, and it is uh, actually showing a very much more accurate representation of of my scene in the viewport. So I, I wanted to show that I wanted to uh, sort of display that for you guys. That is brand new to Moto 901. Um, so besides that, uh, let me go over to my uh, layout mode here, and we'll see in the rendering view, it takes, takes a moment here to, to buffer this scene. But as you can see now, uh, the daylight shader is much more realistic. Um, there's a lot going on in this, in this particular scene here, uh, especially with this uh, amber uh, acrylic uh, hood ornament piece here that is the head of the, the Indian character. You can see uh, there's a lot of sub surface scattering, so a lot of rays are being passed through this. But as you can see, it's rendering relatively quickly. Uh, granted, it is a small render here, but as you can see, the, uh, the daylight shader has vastly improved. Um, if I click on and this is this is I think this is great for uh, let's see let me go to my lights here. This is the directional light that's uh, acting as the sunlight. I'll move this panel up so you can see all the different settings that it has here. Uh, I'll shrink this down a little bit. I'm, I, I shrunk my screen down to be able to accommodate the uh, the internet here, so uh, bear with me. Uh, with the physical sun. We can actually have a time of day, as you can see on the right here, a time of day, uh, daylight savings time, how much haze is in the atmosphere, 
you can clamp the so the intensity of the sun, which I never do actually. We can adjust the gamma as well of this uh, the uh, the sunlight, and uh, also give it a uh, north north offset. And you can actually set coordinates if you want to uh, uh, to different different places in the world: New York, London. It's given this time of day, 1400 hours, and uh, Let's see, London, as we can see, um, see Moscow, I'm really not, not clicking on the right light, but, uh, but uh, these are some of the settings for, for the daylight shader. Uh, so, and I think that's a, a tremendous improvement and it adds a lot of realism uh, to, your, to your scene when you're using a uh, directional sunlight. With that, okay, moving on. I know we're kind of running out of time here. Um, let's see here. I'm going to uh, show you some of our new materials here. This is a really nice scene. It, it kind of demonstrates our, our more uh, physically based uh, shaders here. Uh, This model has uh, has some uh, materials applied to it that allow Moto to actually use physically base materials. Now, Moto is uh, has always been, or more recently, has been uh, a, a hybrid rendering engine, and what that means is that it can be a biased or non-biased rendering engine depending upon your settings. Uh, for those of you that uh, are, are not familiar with bias and non-biased rendering engines, uh, non-biased rendering engines are considered physically accurate, whereas bias uh, rendering engines use kind of shortcuts, for lack of a better uh, terminology, to, to increase the speed of rendering and get as close to accurate as possible. But with our new physically based uh, shading model, uh, which actually is uh, changeable to uh, what we call energy conserving or tr our traditional uh, uh, shading model, which goes back to earlier versions of Moto, but with the physically based shading model, uh, you have um, uh, a lot more control over, over the uh, Realism and uh, and the uh, in particular the specular amount and the Fresnel amount and the reflectivity of your of your object. I'll just uh, move this over to our layout scene here uh, and just do a quick render here. It's going to take a, a moment to buffer this. Typically, physically based uh, materials take a little bit longer to render in some instances, uh, but they're far more accurate. Um, there we go. I'm just going to move this back so you can see this. And as you can see, this is a rather complex material that the uh, uh, the artist created. And if we look at it, we have all these different little areas here, um, and we can adjust uh, now. I should I should state here that Moto has a uh, is traditionally a uh, a, uh, a vertically stacked rendering system, and it's similar to Photoshop in that each of these uh, little elements affects the one above it. Because Moto propagates from the bottom to the top, so we can we can actually if I turn this element off, you can see that the patina that was being used, this occlusion was actually acting as, is, is turned off, it's gone. So turning it on, you can see how that, how that masks. Uh, and I can actually, because this has parameters, I can adjust the amount of uh, patina and, and that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, see that changes how that effect is taking place. 
So yeah, that's a quick, very quick look at some of our physically based uh, materials. And uh, here are tons and tons of different materials you can apply to your object um, simply by dragging and dropping. Uh, let's see what, uh, let's try a silver one. I'm just going to drag and drop this onto here. See what that does. Take a second to render. There we go. And it's probably not the prettiest uh, material that I uh, could have applied in this lighting situation, but uh, as you can see, uh, changing materials is just as easy as dragging and dropping onto your onto your object. So that's uh, that's some physically based materials. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to close all here and move on. One thing I wanted to do before we before I take some questions here is uh, give you a quick demonstration of a plugin that is traditionally a tool that has traditionally been a plugin. Moto, which is now fully integrated into Moto. It's called Fusion. Uh, we used to call it Mesh Fusion. I think we just call it Fusion now. And uh, basically, it's a real time Boolean operation. And uh, it's really quite impressive. Uh, uh, if, if I bring up my uh, bring up my uh, browser here, real quick. Um, I'm going to use those, uh, and I can load in, and I'm just doing this from scratch. I don't have anything really prepared. Uh, I could load in an item, and what we call qubits, and qubits are, are very simply uh, items that are, that are subdivision surface, Count McClark, and they're all quads. That's the only requirement that you need. You can make your own uh, objects and uh, and boolean those, uh, or you can just use uh, what comes with the kit here. Uh, let's do this one, and uh, let's see. Let's, I'll do a couple of things here. I'll do this one since it's got an interesting look to it. Okay. I'm just going to move this out. Okay. Uh, under my item list, I'll select that one, select that one, and I'm going to subtract the first one from the others, and it just takes a second there, and notice that we have a, a Boolean operation here, and this Boolean operation is live, and I'm going to, let's see, uh, Cycle through that. Okay, there we go. There we go. And as you can see, we have relatively clean Boolean operation here. Um, if I want to move this, move this item up, as you can see, it actually cuts the object behind it. And I can continue to add more items to this if I want. Let's go ahead and uh, get another piece here. I'm going to put a little handle on this. Let's do this. Okay. I'm going to uh, select that item. Move it over to the side here. And I'm simply going to just drag the, and drop it on top of the item. And do this as a union. And now those two objects are a single union. I can resize this. There we go. 
and you'll notice that there is a little bit of a chamfer between there, between the two. Let's see if I can select that. Oh, let's see. There's an update control here somewhere. Oh, I know. I have to be in. Uh, there we go. There we go. Now uh, I can select this chamfer between the two, and I can control its width. Uh, there we go. And new to Fusion is an option to maintain the width throughout the. Uh, contrary. Notice how it's how the width of this chamfer is uh, is actually narrowing as it gets to the bottom. Uh, there is a new feature I did not evoke uh, in this in this demonstration, but allows you to keep a consistent width uh, throughout that. So you can change the width. You can do some smoothing on it if you want. And uh, so that there is a lot of controls with the uh, with those. With those pebbles. So, um, yeah. All right. So that's uh, in a nutshell. That's Mesh Fusion. Um, and I think I'm uh, coming close to my time here. Um, Barbara, did you want to uh, start questions? Uh, well, I think you just reinvented the teacup, <laughs> looks like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, we don't have questions. I think everybody's mesmerized. Um, somebody was asking um, about rigging model. Would you like to? Rigging? Rigging, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, not yeah, rigging. We have a few new rigging features, and I'm not really a great uh, uh, rigging person, but let me see if I can call up something. Let's see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me go to, let's see. Let's see. Uh, well, I thought there was one in there. Um, here we go. All right. This is a character we typically uh, show, and you can rig this character in Moto and with all the controls. Uh, but a new feature that we have is instead of having these controls set up like this, you can actually uh, have geometry on your character uh, tagged, various polygons tagged on your character. That allow you to do these same sort of sort of things. So if I wanted to, um, uh, you know, have this character move and IK setup, let me go to my animation mode here, animation viewport. Here we go. You can see the character is already this character is pre-rigged, and he has uh, full inverse kinematics applied. Um, and this rig, as if I'm not mistaken. Uh, was set up in an application that we have called Auto Character Setup, and that is in my setup view. We go here. This is a, a plugin, probably one of the best plugins for Moto uh, for character animation. It allows you to uh, very easily create a, a rig for a bipedal character, and allows you to do all kinds of uh, uh, operations on that rig. Uh, including adjust point, uh, joint influences and uh, that sort of thing. So this is this is uh, one of the characters that uh, we tend to show uh, for doing, uh, you know, for for demonstrating animation. Unfortunately, I am not an <laughs> an animator. Uh, uh, so notice how the head of display controls come up here. Um, I'm going to jump over back into my animation. Here. And you can see here's here's the controls for all the uh, finger bending and, and, and whatnot. So if I just click on uh, one of the, you can see uh, it's getting close here. I'll show you. Um, so I can 
Uh, let's see, it's probably not. So thumb bending here. Uh, I can show the you know index finger bend. Uh, you can enter uh, numeric values if you want, but most people just grab the, uh, the sliders here. If you just click on the word and slide it, you can uh, adjust the the bone. So that's that, and this is probably for this hand, yes. Um, so I can adjust his fingers, and these will all be keyframed as we as we go. There we go. And general fingers to red. There we go. So uh, clicking on this guy brings up a different set of controls. Uh, shoulder arm control, FK, IK, uh, switching. So, and, and these are his eye controls here, his face. I can control uh, with this slider, his eyes open, his eyes closed, and he's squinting because he's angry. Um, his upper eyelid, and he's a bit curious there, not sure what's going on. So, yeah, so this is really quite fun. So, uh, so yeah, Moto is quite uh, quite powerful at uh, animation. I'll go ahead and play this guy. We also have uh, a new feature for the Catmull Clarks, uh, which is uh, adding uh, open subdivision surfaces to that, and that's something that Pixar developed, and we are implementing it as well. And it allows uh, it allows you to have subdivision surfaces that respond much better to animation. There we go. All right. That's great, John. You know, somebody is, uh, yeah, I get great feedback. Somebody's saying, very inspiring. I now want to go from 701 to 901. How can we yeah. do them? Yeah, no. <laughs> 901 uh, just came out with uh, Service Pack 1, uh, which has enhanced its stability in uh, immensely. Uh, it's uh, 901. On the release of 901, it uh, was so feature-packed uh, that now um, now we're focusing on uh, uh, you know, and we, we test it as much as we can. But until it gets into the real world out there, uh, some people uh, find little little bugs here and there. But we squashed, I think, uh, just a phenomenal number of bugs, and it's very very stable. I'm using that right now. And uh, not had any not had any issues or problems whatsoever. But yeah, so um, we are also uh, embarking on a much more accelerated development program as well. So the service packs and features and fixes and those sorts of things will be coming out and more often. So yeah, what are you waiting for? That's my question. <laughs> yes. So um, yes. <laughs> great, fantastic. That was very very entertaining, John. I'm sorry yeah. to have to interrupt this and you know end the show for everybody, but uh, I you know I want you to get on Modo right away and uh, right. well, you I know just, uh, try for yourself. Yes, I actually just touched the surface. Uh, there's a lot more features, including scripting, Python scripting. So if you are a uh, person who is uh, predisposed to writing your own scripts and code, you can do it right within Moto now and uh, compile that and execute those scripts uh, from without having to leave Moto. So uh, I wanted to, before I left, I wanted to make sure I touched on that as well because for the visual effects industry, that's huge. That's a big deal. Yeah. So is uh, is there anything Moto cannot do? No, no, okay. uh, not that I can think of. Off the top of my head. Everything that I want want to do with it, he can do, and 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 far more. Um, I like I uh, like you you mentioned. I had spent nearly 20 years in the visual effects community, and we are now seeing uh, a lot of uh, visual effects studios uh, integrating Modo into their pipeline. It's not something that they're replacing their existing tools with, but they're adding it to their to their pipeline as uh, as an additional tool. Um, I've worked with uh, both Moto and Maya, and I have worked 
uh, in bringing myosins into moto and vice versa and it works very well it worked very well in in uh, 701 and 801 and we've improved the FBX loaders and the uh, uh, and the alembic loaders a lot so so that there's a lot more features that you can load including particles and uh, and those sorts of things into moto from other applications you you are the, the great testimony. so I would encourage anybody uh, yes yeah well I, I would encourage anybody who can attend SIGGRAPH this year uh, in in Los Angeles uh, to to do so. Um, it's going to be quite impressive. They're going to be showing some new tools, uh, not just the Moto, but the Foundry will be uh, showing some uh, new new features and new tools. So. Oh, just, you know, you have a, it's a date then. Okay, I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar, and I also want to remind you to visit our page at Novage.com, where you will find Moto 901. And Novetch is the best way to buy design software online. So come visit us. For information on the latest specials, new releases, join the Novetch Network on Facebook or Plus or Twitter and subscribe to the Novetch blog. And don't forget the next webinar is about Max Render, Essential Kits, and the new version 3.2. To rewatch today's webinar or previous one, check out our Novetch YouTube and Vimeo channels, our webinar playlist, as webinars for every software taste. Thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful day, and thank you so much, John, for a very entertaining uh, hour. Uh, well, thank you, Barbara, and I want to thank our uh, viewers for uh, tuning in and giving me the opportunity to share with them something that I'm very passionate about. Thank you, John. Till next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, folks.